Hebrew Union College. She had previously gone to Israel with the intention of becoming a doctor before she was diverted into a much more rewarding life than medical life could possibly be. Um, and uh, not only is she a rabbi in the progressive community in France, she's been the editor since 2009 of Tenua Review, became editor in chief and to 2012 managing editor. Um, she is uh, the author of a book on uh, anti-Semitism, which is available, as I said before, on Amazon in English. Um, and I believe, uh, in addition to, by the way, now six books in French, and uh, we look forward not only to learning from her, but uh, to getting to know her work increasingly in the months and uh, years ahead. So welcome back. And we're so happy and grateful to Abner and Ross Goldstein once again for making it possible for us to learn from you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wolpe, for this introduction. And thank you for the invitation. I, it would be wonderful if you were to come to Paris, indeed, to continue the learning. I look forward to that opportunity. Uh, it was truly a pleasure this week to spend those moments uh, with you. So to, tonight, today, is the third part of our, um, of our discussion. Um, and it's taking place in a very special day, actually, of the French calendar, because today is the national national uh, holiday in France. It's a national holiday. Today is November 11th, which commemorates uh, the end of World War I, uh, November 11th, 1918. On that day was signed the armistice, the end of the uh, a terrible nightmare for Europe and for the world. Uh, ceasefire was signed on that day between countries, and it was the end of a devastating uh, period of time of four years, 1914 until 1918. During that period of time, as you know, almost 19 million uh, people uh, died here in Europe. And I think it's very symbolic, actually, to discuss on this day with you to talk about uh, the topic I chose for our conversations about the French Republic triptych, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, Freedom, Equality, and Brotherhood. So we started a few days ago with an exploration of the notion of uh, freedom in uh, French ethos, American ethos, and also in the Jewish and rabbinic literature. And I tried in the first session to illustrate that in Jewish thought, the notion of freedom is uh, obviously associated with liberation from Egypt, but also to um, a kind of paradoxical notion of void. Uh, the word uh, freedom in Hebrew, cherut, literally means uh, emptiness, void. And a free person is um, someone who manages to get rid of an obsession for plenitude or completedness. Egypt for the rabbi is a place of idolatry. It's a place where people used to worship solar disks, uh, shapes of uh, integrity and completely full images. Whereas for them in the desert, the Israelites uh, had to learn to live with uh, missing parts, with broken tablets, with destroyed idols. And freedom is therefore for the rabbis, the condition of a person who is able to experience brokenness and to experience sometimes mourning and to remain standing and uh, walking. And as I said, in a way it goes against a common understanding in our modern societies, the common understanding that our modern societies have about freedom. In our societies, uh, often people believe that freedom has to do with a kind of hermetic frontier, with closed territory that another needs to respect, uh, respect for a private property, for example, where no one steps on each other's territory. And people don't necessarily associate freedom Freedom with that idea of vulnerability or fragility or with the consciousness of void. Then in our second session, uh, we explore together the notion of equality. And again, this sacred notion for our Western societies, uh, the fight for equality between all citizens at the core uh, of both the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Well, we discuss the fact that it's, bo it's both comforted and challenged by biblical and rabbinic literature. So of course, the Bible emphasizes the importance of equal rights 
for all, especially facing the justice system and the market system. Uh, Leviticus, for example, uh, in the Torah, Levit the book of Leviticus insists on the fact that the judges should not make any preference uh, for rich or poor, uh, that the justice should be the same for Israelites and non-Israelites, for strangers uh, and the widow and the orphans should be treated equally, et cetera, et cetera. And the Bible also insists on the fact that the scales on the market should be right so that no one should be discriminated in their transactions, uh, commercial or judicial uh, business. But at the same time, at the same time, we studied together the notion of uh, Kedusha, uh, which we sometimes translate as sanctity, but which literally means in Hebrew, the ability to set apart. And in the Bible, um, we know that certain times in the calendar, like for example, Shabbat, and certain people like the Israelites are defined as Kadosh, not simply as holy, but we should say as differentiated, as set apart. And the Hebrews and later the Jews for the rabbis are considered kadosh in the sense that certain duties and commandments and obligations and sometimes rights befall on them and on them only. And in a way, in a way, this essential separation might go against the modern definition of equality, because Kedusha seems to imply separation and frontiers and differentiations, and it cannot fit exactly um, the notion of equality as we understand it often in modern societies. So we studied together uh, the famous story of Cain and Abel, you know, the rise of violence in the Bible, um, which has something to do with the inability by Cain to accept inequality in the world. You probably, you probably remember uh, this famous story. Cain, at the beginning of the Bible, offers a sacrifice to God and Abel does the same, but God accepts Abel's offering and not Cain's offering. And then uh, the Torah says that Cain's face falls which is the Hebrew image, the image the Bible uses to depict pain uh, or anger or sadness. So Cain experiences injustice and he perceives the situation to be unequal, to be unfair. And this feeling precisely, um, which according to God, to God's words in Genesis, could have led Cain to lift himself up, this is the expression that is used in the Bible, in tetiv seta, you can find verticality, says God to Cain, in this moment. Uh, well, it will lead him precisely to the contrary. Cain is unable to handle this feeling of inequality, and it leads him to violence, and he becomes the first murderer. Uh, in the history of humanity. Violence, as we said, um, often comes from an interpretation made by the violent person uh, to, to understand that he's a victim of an injustice, of an unfair situation. And suddenly his envy and jealousy might lead him to eliminate the person he perceives to be uh, luckier than him or maybe more equal than him, closer to an ideal of what equality should be. And we discussed together how this pattern has in fact a lot to do with anti-Semitism because Jews in history, just like Abel, have been perceived very often as being preferred by God, as being more lucky or having more blessings, and the paradox is that Jews have often been hated for being perceived as too loved, for a kind of fantasy in the anti-Semitic mind. They are becoming a subject of envy. They supposedly have more, own more, know more, and therefore seem to steal from someone else what could have been his. I'm sure you're very familiar with this 
international anti-Semitic uh, rhetorics. And this is how we reach the third notion tonight, today, it's night in France, so tonight in France, the third notion of the, the French uh, Republican triptych. Together we dive into the notion of brotherhood, which is probably the most difficult one to explore, as no one really knows uh, in our society, and I include, I include here the French and the American society, no one really knows what this notion might mean. What do we mean when we talk about brotherhood? in society? Are we, are we really supposed to experience a feeling of um, fraternity and brotherhood toward our fellow citizens so, or to pretend in the way that they are members of our family or um, to say it more clearly that we have the same parents, that maybe we share, we share the same origin or the same womb? Of course, this is a fiction. And sometimes this allegory uh, might be problematic. Uh, first, it's, it's problematic because the word fraternity, brotherhood, seems to exclude all of you, a big part of humanity, the sisters. Fraternity is a term that supposedly includes all humanity, but leaves aside the feminine part of it. And some people suggest, as you know, that we should add sorority in the triptych of the French Republic. Uh, but the fact that this noun, fraternity, brotherhood, is supposedly in French both masculine and neutral is in itself quite uh, interesting. Uh, but now let's think about a biblical narrative that might help us uh, explore this notion. Um, as I said, when we explore uh, freedom in the Bible, we immediately are led to think about the book of Exodus leaving slavery in Egypt. Uh, when we explore equality, I quoted last time very often the book of Leviticus, because Leviticus is a book that deals at length with Kedusha, with the notion of separation and the concept of equality facing justice, for example. So to explore brotherhood, I think that the most obvious book we need to explore is of course the book of Genesis. Uh, why? Because the entire book of Genesis could easily be summed up in almost one sentence. If I had to give a, a pitch to tell you uh, what is the central story of Genesis, I would probably tell you something like, uh, uh, this is a book that keeps saying, I can't stand my brother. Uh, and you know that the examples are multiple in the, in the book of uh, Genesis. Each and every generation in the book repeats or seem to repeat the same pattern and phenomenon. The very first brotherhood ends with an, ass an assassination. Uh, Cain kills Abel, and when he's asked about why, what he's done, he answers this classical verse, am I my brother's keeper? But actually, the curse keeps repeating itself. You know, Isaac and Ismail's rival, rivalry leads to their separation. They will be raised apart, and they will only find each other again in one situation in the Bible when they are said to bury their father, Abram, together in the cave of Marpella. So in Genesis, brothers seem to reunite at burials, as if death was following their path and saying something about their inability to live together. Uh, then later on, Jacob is convinced that his brother Isa wants to kill him because he stole um, twice a blessing. Uh, and you remember Rachel and Leah were fighting for Jacob's attention and Jacob's affection. And later their children will continue the fight. And we know that jealousy and envy and a perception of inequality will lead Joseph's brother to think about his murder, but actually to sell him into slavery, to Egypt. Well, you see, it's the same story again and again until almost the end of the book. The very last generation in the book of uh, of uh, Genesis is the generation of the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Menashe. And those kids are the ones we refer to every Friday night when we bless our children. You know that we place our hands above their heads and we say, may you be like Ephraim and Menashe. 
this couple of brothers is the very first one in the Bible who seems to be able to escape the curse of family rivalry. According to Midrash, Ephraim and Menashe are very, very different. They, they acknowledge they did not receive the same blessing. Uh, but nevertheless, um, and even though, even though one of them might feel that the situation is unfair or might experience uh, inequality, they manage to be at peace with each other. And Ephraim and Menashe, therefore, represent in the tradition the beginning of a healthy brotherhood and maybe the end of jealousy we are invited to envision. And they also, of course, prefigure or announce another powerful brotherhood, the one that uh, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam will represent in the following book, in the book of Exodus. And those three, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, are uh, definitely in a situation of uh, inequality of tasks and uh, missions. Each one of them is called to become something different, a prophet or a guide and a priest, but they can grow in the same family even though they're unequal and their difference will be a force and not a curse in the rest of the story. But the book of Genesis is an invitation to think about the almost impossible task of loving one's brother, a task made um, even more impossible by the fact that uh, parents in Genesis seems to repeat the same terrible pattern, uh, the pattern of preference of one child over another. Uh, now, psychology, modern psychology, since uh, Sigmund Freud, warns us um, of the same consequences in many families and family structures. We know that younger brothers and sisters always have, in each generation, always have to go through the same journey, more or less, and uh, have a hard time accepting the unbearable fact that their parents apparently gave exclusive love to their older siblings before they, come, they came to the world, before they, was, they were born. And how can it be? How can it be that my parents loved someone uh, so much before I came to the world? And what happened when I showed up? Um, did my parents stop loving my older sibling? Did they keep a higher level of love for him, for their firstborn? Uh, I know this is a kind of 101 uh, psychology class reflection, but in the Bible, um, this brotherly uh, conversation is, uh, is essential. Um, by the way, I think that this family psychology consideration is not unrelated to patterns of anti-Semitism. Again, uh, especially I would say uh, related, to, related to theological anti-Semitism and religious anti-Semitism. Um, as you know, for many centuries, Christianity precisely had to deal with this question toward Judaism. Um, if Christian faith is born after uh, Jewish heritage, then what is God's relationship to the older brother, the Jew? As you know, for many centuries, and especially in the wave of the, what we call the Augustinian theology of uh, supersessionism, um, the central idea of Christian thought, thought was that Christians replaced the Jews as being the um, Verus Israel, the true chosen people by God. And the Jews who refused to convert or to abandon their faith were perceived as uh, rebellious children or people who lost God's love and can therefore be punished or cursed for that. And the same phenomenon um, exists also, um, or some elements of this phenomenon exist in Muslim theologies, uh, we read sometime in uh, Islamic literature, the idea that Jews and even Christians uh, somehow falsified, changed the text of the true revelation um, as if the last son, the last child who appears in history, Islam, uh, was suddenly the only truthful son or the only worthy child. So, 
as you can imagine, um, those two patterns of um, elimination of the firstborn child, Judaism, uh, suggesting that its message is either, either expired historically or theologically or truncated the message, were very powerful theological weapons uh, against Jews. And still they remain in, in some part um, of the world. So brotherhood in the Bible is a very central notion. Um, brothers have to learn to live together one way or the other. But in the Bible, the condition for their coexistence is always an acknowledgement that their fates are separate and their fates are not common. They have to learn about their difference and accept that coming from the same matrix, womb, origin, they have to grow in different directions, acknowledging their personal blessing and their personal strength. Of course, the best example of this is the one that we currently read in the parasha, those weeks in the synagogues, when we read the story of Jacob and Isa, uh, you know, the twin brothers who fight uh, from the womb and we present for the rabbis um, two, possible way, two possible ways of being, uh, two identity definitions that keep struggling uh, with each other until they meet again and they acknowledge, this is what we're going to read in the coming weeks, uh, they acknowledge that they won't share exactly the same territory. Um, so understand me well, I'm not saying that brothers should never share a territory. It would be a it would be, of course, devastating if we were to believe that we should erect walls between us all. But I believe that to live peacefully on one territory, we probably have to recognize the power of different blessings. Um, and to understand it and to illustrate it, let me tell you a very important piece of recent French history. As I said, um, as we speak now, um, as we speak now, France commemorates um, uh, today, the end of World War I, but exactly as we speak also in this time is taking place in Paris, a very important and historical trial. Uh, for the past month, every day in the heart of Paris, um, not very far from here, is conveyed a court to judge the terrible events of November uh, 2015. Uh, you probably remember the night of terror in Paris, uh, uh, in the Bataclan theater, and in coffee shops in the heart of Paris, where hundreds of young people were murdered by Islamist um, uh, terrorists. Uh, now, terror specialists, experts, and psychoanalysts in France became, in recent years, interested in a weird phenomenon uh, that seems to keep repeating itself. Uh, let me give you a few dates and uh, names to understand that phenomenon. Um, April 2012, uh, Mohamed Merah kills two French soldiers, three Jewish children in a Jewish school and one parent, one father in front of a school in Toulouse. Um, his brother, Abdelkader Merah, helped him commit his crime and is currently in jail. January 7th, 2015, uh, Sheriff Kwashi and Said Kwashi, two terrorists, uh, kill 12 people at Charlie Hebdo uh, and their brothers. And November 2015, Bataclan is attacked and coffee shops are attacked in Paris. And in the terrorist groups, the two major organizers are two brothers, Salah Abdeslam, who is currently judge in Paris, not far from here, and his brother, Brahim, who was killed by the police. And the pattern see, keeps repeating itself. In the last terror attacks in France are always involved brothers uh, who claim to unite in their fight against France or against Jews or against the Western world or non-believers. And many terror experts also notice that the word brother constantly appears in communications by Al-Qaeda or Daesh, and the language is always revolving around this notion of brotherhood. Our brothers committed an attack. 
our brothers died in martyrdom, etc., etc. And it's quite interesting, I think, that for those killers and extremists, violence is committed as a kind of sacred covenant between brothers, as if the very definition of brotherhood for them was the capacity to, to die with someone or to kill with someone. And it's interesting because precisely in rabbinic literature, brotherhood and the challenge of brotherhood is the opposite. It's an attempt to live side by side, which generally imply, implies to recognize that there is no fusion nor in life, nor in death. Um, and the harmony between brothers imply not to kill, but to accept the other as an other. And to be able to sit by his side, just like you know, in the famous Hebrew song, manaim, how pleasant and good, Shevet Achim Kam Yachad, to sit brothers and sisters side by side. Uh, so this is why I think that the notion of brotherhood in the context of violent times, uh, when terrorists uh, and extremists do confiscate this notion in the name of violence, is a very uh, important thing to do. I'd like to conclude with a word in Hebrew, a word in Hebrew that could actually summarize our entire three sessions of learning. Just one word which could, which could I think, sum up what I tried to, to taught and uh, um, that actually I would add, if I could, to the famous triptych of the French Republic. If I add to, um, add a fourth notion to liberté, égalité, fraternité, I would probably add the magnificent word of responsibility, responsibility, as I think that precisely very often freedom, equality, and brotherhood are jeopardized or threatened when people refuse to take responsibility or refuse to engage their responsibility. When we begin to think that our freedom is impossible because of someone else's responsibility, or when equality seems impossible for us and we deny our responsibility in the process of changing a reality, or when another person who should be treated as a brother becomes charged with responsibility over our problems, of what we perceive to be our problems in society. So then, we should think about the power of responsibility. In Hebrew, uh, the word responsibility is an amazing one. You know, responsibility in Hebrew is called acharayut. And I invite you to think about how this word is written in Hebrew, how we write it letter by letter. Acharayut com comes from the root acharai, acharai. And when you write that word, you first write the letter Aleph. Aleph is, of course, the letter in Hebrew of Ani or Anochi. It's the letter of the first person singular of the I, myself, I as a subject. Then when you write Acharayut, you immediately write the letter Chet and you get Aleph Chet, which writes the word brother, Ach, Achot, brother, sister. Responsibility is always a face to face between us and a closed one, between me and my brother. And then when we write a charayot, we add an extra letter, Aleph, Chet, Resh, which writes the word Acher, the other, the rest of the world. And finally, we add a last letter, Acharai, Aleph, Chet, Resh, Yud, writes the word Acharai after me, what comes next. So to summarize it, responsibility in Hebrew is written in the following manner, me, my brother and sister, the others, and what will come after. And I think it summarizes beautifully what should be our common dedication, uh, what should be our common preoccupation wherever we live in France or in America, an ability to take responsibility for ourselves, to also say that we will be our brothers 
keepers in a way or another, that we will care for our brothers and sisters and care for others, and that this care will engage future generations. So it's a vast program, but I think that on both sides of the ocean, we may find people willing to accept that challenge and to say, in Neni, here we are. Thank you again for this invitation. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful conclusion to the uh, triptych, as you say, of uh, the Scholar in Residence Weekend. I want to start by asking you um, what seems to me to be clear is that the sense of responsibility for one another as a society has been diminishing rather than growing over the past 20, 30, 50 years. Um, and there was a time in America and in France, I suppose, when people felt that other people's children were also their responsibility and that the entire city or village was their responsibility. But increasingly, there's a sort of atomization in a sense that I and mine are my responsibility, but you have to take care of your own. Uh, to what do you attribute that? And maybe what is there in our tradition that might address it? Mm -hmm. Well, it, I, it's interesting that you mentioned that because this morning I went to commemorations and my, my daughter was singing at a commemoration for November 11th. She was singing the Marseillaise with a group of young people. And, uh, and I was thinking that, you know, when we commemorate uh, World War I or even World War II here in commemorations in France, we always use languages of uh, brotherhood, but, but mainly me messages of uh, uh, we perceived the ones who died as being the children of the nation, you know, and the responsibility is engaged for each other. We, we talk about ourselves as a large family. And uh, it seemed indeed, as you say, that um, from time to time, I don't know if it's in the if it's recent, I think it's more when suddenly a society goes through certain crisis, it has a hard time perceiving itself still as a, as a family. And suddenly uh, moments, just like the one we experience, I feel today, are particularly critical um, in the development, for example, of scapegoat phenomenons. You know, we, we talked uh, in the last session, in the second session, about the scapegoat episode in the, um, in the Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, the, this passage that we read on Yom Kippur about the scapegoat. It's quite interesting because it, in a way, it reenacts a bit differently Cain and Abel's episode. You know, uh, um, instead of having two brothers, we have two goats totally similar to one another, one will be chosen to be on the altar and the other will be sent to the desert the way Cain will be sent forever to be a wanderer. And I think it's interesting that we keep reenacting and we, we are constantly warned in our tradition about scapegoat phenomenons uh, when a, a society suddenly is unable to handle responsibility and will charge elements of the family with a weight that will not allow those elements to remain members of the family. And um, so I think this is indeed totally related in times of crisis, um, scapegoat phenomenons and conspiracy theories also go very well hand in hand with this notion. The idea that when you're going through hard times, through dark moments, um, individually or collectively, then the easiest path is to place the weight of responsibility upon, uh, someone's, uh, upon someone's head, just like in the scapegoat goat phenomenon, or um, in someone else's hands. Uh, and we Jews are very familiar with the phenomenon of conspiracy theories, which always works well with anti-Semitism. You know, when you look at uh, caricatures of Jews, uh, along the ages, uh, Jews are always caricatured and drawn with uh, very, very long fingers because they're perceived to be manipulative agents. Right. They have into their hands the power that we don't have. You know, it's a way to de-responsibilize yourself by attributing the large hands power to someone else. And when, 
when you talk about de-responsibilizing yourself, which I think is a great word. I love that word. Um, I think that when people, it's I'm not- sorry, again, I'm speaking French. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Um, but it's not only about whether people take responsibility, it's what they take responsibility for. Somebody who bombs a synagogue thinks I'm taking responsibility to solve this problem. Um, nobody else is going to bomb the synagogue, so I better do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the part of it is, I think, the orientation of hair taking that allows you to see other people as they are and not as the figments of your imagination. And as you pointed out again and again, Jews have played the role of other people's demons in their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, you, you, your point is a very important uh, one. Very often the um, uh, terrorists or killers or um, violent people are convinced when they act that they're doing it in the name of the, um, you know, that they are acting out their responsibility in a way that they are, um, what I said before um, is that very often they are convinced that they're simply trying to restore equality in a world uh, where it disappeared. And often uh, uh, the person they attacked, and it's really clear when, when we're talking about anti-Semitic attacks, I think it's, it's common that the Jews are attacked very often because they are perceived as owning something that should be mine. You right. know, like they, they, it's as if, you know, in French we say, we call it to us usurpate. Do you have some, a word like this in English? Yeah, to usurp. Yeah. To usurp. usurp yeah. Yeah. So Jews are often perceived as honing, having um, something that should be much more, uh, you know, dispatch in the society. How is it that the, you know, the fantasy about the Jews right. is that we have something bigger, larger, more blessed than others, which actually I find interesting because, um, you know, and I, I developed it in my, in my book about anti-Semitism. This creates a kind of difference between racism, classical racism and anti-Semitism. Very often in pure racism, um, racist, a racist mind considers that the other is below him. The right. other doesn't have the right accent, the right color of skin, uh, the right education, doesn't belong to the right civilization or whatever. So it's a kind of a superiority complex that is affirmed in racism, whereas anti-Semitism is very often an inferiority complex. The idea that I should be above, yeah. but the Jews are owning that place, you know, above right. me. And therefore, I'm below. So there was an English scholar named Hyman Maccabee who said that the fact that Jews are sometimes seen as subhuman, like the Nazis saw them as vermin, but at the same time, as you point out, seen as superhuman, is a unique phenomenon in hatred. And he attributed it to the fact that the Christian myth that Jews killed Jesus, in order to be able to kill a god, you have to be superhumanly evil. So Jews can't just be normally evil. They have to be superhumanly evil or they couldn't have killed a God. And I always thought, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a very interesting theory. Yeah, it, it, indeed. It's, it's interesting that anti-Semitism is able to combine uh, the two extremes, right. or the two sides of the medals. Also on another topic that I, I became a few years ago very interested in this topic, which is the relationship between uh, misogyny and anti-Semitism that is not so often explored, but it's quite striking when you get interested in that topic that along history, very often Jews have been accused precisely of what women have been accused of. Like, you know, mm. it was often said that Jews, uh, you know, um, you can't rely upon them. They love right. money. They love being close to powerful people. They're a bit hysterical, etc. All those They're classical... Yeah. yeah, so so it's interesting that... Jew, Jews have been perceived as being the, the women of history, in a way, um, uh, and especially in times when a society becomes obsessed with virility um, and, again, elements of completedness, um, unfiability, like, you know, unbroken identities, very, uh, societies attached to certain image of strong virility have, um, have a tendency, indeed, to to develop an anti-women, anti-Jewish discourse that go 
hand in hand. During my research, I found very striking elements of uh, history. For example, uh, the fact that during the Middle Age, um, many people, uh, many anti-Semites, believed during the Middle Age that uh, Jewish men had their period every month. So they're <laughs> convinced that there was a Jewish really? menstruation because the Jewish body was perceived to be not completely viral. So in a way, anti-Semitism went into that direction. But as you said, we witness today that it goes also in the extreme opposite direction. And sometimes you hear even inside the feminist discourse today, some radical feminist discourse, sometimes there is certain resonance of a certain um, anti-Semitic tonality of associating Jews with uh, over virility, you know, the right. idea, that, you know, very often, for example, Israel. Is, exactly, exactly. The anti-Zionist discourse is right. sometimes accusing Jews of being too military, virile, or disrespecting femininity. So as you said before, it's interesting because anti-Semitism has this power to attack Jews on both sides, to uh, consider that they own too much, or are too poor, that they are against the system or they represent the system, that they invented Jesus but do not believe in Jesus, that they are too feminist or too patriarchal. And, you know, and it can go on and on. And it does. Read Communist, and capitalist, it goes on and on exactly. and on. Um, so yeah. do, you, do you find uh, in your time in the United States and in France, do you find any essential differences between the anti-Semitism that you found there and found find, find here? Well, frankly, no, not really, because I think that um, we have to be able that to understand on both sides of the oceans that anti-Semitism comes from many, many different directions. So obviously today, the French Jewish community is more concerned about anti-Semitism coming from the, um, the left and coming from the Muslim world, um, the Muslim communities here in France, whereas probably America is, has been more concerned in recent years about um, um, hate speeches coming maybe from extreme right. But, but we have to understand it's the same language. The same language is spoken uh, with, I would say, different accents on the left and the right and in theological and non-theological, uh, non-religious uh, anti-Semitism, but it's always the same language. So I do feel that we are actually fighting the same, um, the same struggle and I'm afraid we're gonna fight it for many, many years ahead, probably even uh, eternally in a way or another. Um, and how important, like what's the role of politics and the responsibility of the Jewish community as a political entity um, in combating anti-Semitism? Like what advice essentially do you have for Americans as American Jewish political actors? Well, it's, it, I think it's, it's critical to create alliances and to battle as we can not to remain alone you know my experience in France what I, we discussed in the first session a little bit is that the French Jewish community has experienced a very high level of um, solitude of loneliness in the past uh, years and wasn't able really to find um, to know exactly who would be their allies in this right. fight clearly the government was a, a powerful ally in its policy in its fight against anti-semitism but it often felt that um, um, the alliance between the Jewish community and the public power could play against us. You know, I'll give you like an example. Uh, uh, when synagogues were attacked or there were, there were threats on synagogues here in Paris, uh, there were policemen placed at the entrance of each synagogue and Jewish community center here very, very fast. And in... Um, in a, in a terrible, as a terrible, how do you say in English, catch 20, sure. 22. I never know if it's 21 or 22. Yeah. <laughs> 22. <laughs> you know, right, catch. it's a made up term, so either one yeah. would be fine. <laughs> in a catch 22, some people started to perceive that somehow the Jews were more protected than right. the others. So you see the paradox. We are threatened, so the, the government 
ensure the Jewish protection. And then it might lead us to be even more vulnerable because we're perceived as being more protected than other community. And it's very, very difficult to, to escape, to avoid this uh, scenario that, uh, you know, that, that uh, might actually threaten us more than it protects uh, us. Now, another scenario that, scenario that we witness here today that maybe in America you experience in a very different manner, but maybe you have another experience of this is the is the the fact that you know, we are run, we are going now through a year of a presidential election, and right. for the first time in history, we witness a phenomenon of um, a Jewish candidate. He's not officially declared, but he would probably be a candidate in the run. Is Jewish. Right. Uh, and is clearly from the extreme right of the extreme right. And it's the first time in history that we have suddenly um, a feeling that the Jewish community is split. I wouldn't be able to give numbers. I think the majority of the French community is very against this candidate, but still he operates a kind of seduction over a part of the Jewish community here in the name of his discourse against Islam and against um, the threat of Islam for the French society, he manages to seduce part of the French com Jewish community today and to create um, you know, a, a very dramatic um, rift inside the community. I had never witnessed this before here in France, but I have to say that um, um, when I look at the social media now in the French Jewish community, I witnessed level of uh, oppositions uh, that I had never witnessed before. People from the same family were not willing to talk to each other anymore around the question of uh, Zemmour and the extreme right, right etc. So I think it's interesting to, um, to see that, I think this could be the next threat for the French Jewish community. That, that has happened here without question over the past, uh, I guess, eight, 10 years, um, that there's been exactly that kind of division in the Jewish community. Brother, so to, back to your we, brother against brother. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where I think we, we have to learn from you now. You know, very often the American friends have asked me um, um, uh, how should we get ready for anti-Semitic wave? It seems that France has a few head, few years ahead in this fight. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's true. I don't know. But, but um, I think that now we are going through a new journey where I think uh, we could learn from American communities in the way they managed to handle in the past years um, situations of uh, strong conflicts inside the family on political I am issues. not sure. I'm not sure how much there is to learn from us. Not sure how well we did it. Um, we can just tell you that it has it has happened. And one of the things that has been, it's not only, by the way, in the Jewish community. I mean, every year now you see articles coming out, how, how to get along at your Thanksgiving table without talking about politics or so on, because politics have become so divisive, which leads me actually to one of the reasons I think that everybody would, would say that one of the reasons it has become so divisive is that social media is, is created, the algorithms are uh, enacted in order to polarize. That's how social media makes its money. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know what the solution to that is, but at least part of it, um, it seems to me, is uh, to pay attention to the effects of social media on especially younger people. Yeah, and to maybe to reconsider what are the Jewish principles of uh, machloket, which is right. exactly the opposite as what social media offers. You know, social yeah. media, as you say today, it, it tends to organize uh, like boxing fight between two right. sides, where a third side is uh, simply liking or, or disliking one of the fighters, whereas machloket is supposedly precisely not that. It's a possibility right. to get convinced through someone else's arguments that you were wrong. Right. Machloket, for those of you who are watching who don't know the term, is the Hebrew term for an argument or a debate. And it comes actually from the word chelek, which means part of. So in a machloket, you only get part of the truth. You never get all of the truth. Every side of the machloket has a chelek, has a piece. Um, 
but it's hard to convince people that that's so. And one of the reasons I think, and you see this, I'm sure in your political uh, discourse now, is once you are part of one side or the other, your tribe counts on you to defend their peace. And if you make any concession to the other side, the people who you're talking to, who are behind you feel betrayed um, by the fact that you said something that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very, very tribal and, uh, and, and inflexible. Yeah, it's, a, it's exactly the issue we are facing now. And we know that the, the opponents gains uh, power each time you attack him because it strengthens uh, the idea of strong right. oppositions and and uh, you know, words words apart in a way so but at the same time it's very very difficult to acknowledge that the other still has a room in the conversation it always brings us back to the table of the setter you know and to the four sons and how do we make sure that the rebellious son in a way is still sitting around the table it's not always um, it's not always uh, easy. It's very, it's very, very difficult. Uh, in the in the last session, in the second session, we discussed um, also this question of, um, you know, I, I tried in my rabbinate in the past years to keep a dialogue open, uh, also with the ultra orthodox world uh, in Israel and in France, or uh, to keep channels of discussions open when sometimes they seem to be totally locked. And 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 I said that for me. Um, uh, very often I, I'm, I came to recognize that the true difference between the person I talk to and me is that very often in, on the other side stands someone who is convinced that is uh, the voice, for example, of true Judaism. That you know you, and I'm sure it happened to you a lot also that you speak sure. with someone and he's convinced that simply is the true version and right. you're a fake one. And and I think that. Facing that, the difference is, is, is not that I, the very difference between them and me is that I don't believe that my version is the true one. I believe that we both have versions of what Judaism can be. And my version is not is, but I wouldn't say that mine is more authentic or less authentic. But right. it creates a real discrepancy in the conversation when one side believes is the authentic one and the other side believes that there is no authenticity, you know. Right. Well, the, the, the idea, yes, that you believe that you have something to learn from someone and the other person believes they have nothing to learn from you creates an asymmetry that makes conversation very difficult. And also, of course, you start off with the I don't know whether it makes it easier or harder to speak to Orthodox communities that you're a female rabbi. In some ways, it might make it easier because sometimes when when you see the other person is completely illegitimate, it's easy to talk to them. Just like ultra orthodox rabbis can talk to priests very easily because they're completely not. But to talk to a male who claims he's a rabbi who's not an orthodox rabbi is too close and is really upsetting. So this is what Freud called the narcissism of small differences. If you're only a little bit different from somebody, then you need to push them away much harder than if you're very different from somebody. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, that's why interreligious dialogue is sometimes easier than intra. <laughs> yes, it's so true. I mean, when you go and visit a church, everybody's so nice. <laughs> you go and speak in a synagogue, people object sometimes. Uh, so um, I wonder how uh, how you, which you talked about a little bit in the second session, but I want to say more. Is there especially on an emotional level, is there something you understand, and you started to open this up about misogyny, but is there something you understand about the emotional need? What did Ephraim have that, that Esau and Jacob didn't have, that, that Isaac and Ishmael didn't have? Like, what was his ability, do you think, um, or Menashe, in fact, who's the real hero, what did Menashe have to be able to accept the fact that his brother was put over him that we could learn from? What quality are we looking for? Because sometimes, you know, sometimes liberté, equality, I mean, liberté is, is at, at odds with fraternity. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, the fact is that we, we, we don't exactly know what it takes for suddenly um, this brotherhood rivalry to, to, be, to be a piece. But what I find striking, you know, on Friday night when we bless our children with these names, on yeah. the five menashe, we, I think we always need to listen to the meaning of these names more even than the story of these people. Like when, when Joseph uh, becomes a father, he first has a son called Menashe, which means uh, that he was able to forget the pain of his youth. Right. And, and then he has another child, Ephraim, which means that he, he will blossom in his life in the future. Right. So he has two sons called, I can, for, I can forget and right. I will blossom. And I find very powerful the fact that when we, bless our children and we place so much weight literally on their head and shoulders it might be interpreted as a as a way to tell them don't forget where you come from right. don't forget our history remember 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 but at the same time we whisper in their ears you can forget a little bit <laughs> and then you're awesome <laughs> because actually sometimes uh, the condition to grow is to be able to both remember your your story but also Forget it enough so that it will not define everything you right. are. You know, I think a lot about it today also in, in the context, and I think the blessed context of a generation where so many people who were not able to talk about their trauma and remain silent about, silent about what happened to them can suddenly talk about their experience. You know, I'm thinking about you know, many abuses uh, that were yeah. remained silent for a generation, and now we we hear victims talking. And I yeah. think it's a good thing that the people can talk about what happened to them. But there is also a threat in this phenomenon that we witness: is that when you talk about what happened to you, you should be really careful that you will not be only defined by what happened to you. Right. I, I think the problem with victim being a victim or victimhood is that it might threaten you with telling everything about who you are. And, you know, none of us is simply what happened to him. You know, we are always something beyond what happened to us because we are actually what we do with what happened to us, you know. And I think it's a very important thing to remember that when we tell our story, we tell this, this story to remember the story, but also to claim that part of it can be forgotten enough so that we can go to another direction and never let what happened to us say everything of our identity. I, I wonder, I think about that a lot. I remember I, a couple of years ago, I visited Vietnam and I realized they talk about the war far, far, far less than I would have expected. It's mostly not discussed. And I thought if it was a Jewish country, it, there would be a memorial on every corner. And I mean, we're still talking about Tisha B'Av and I don't know which is, I don't know if there's a better or worse, but it's a very different cultural attitude to remember all the traumas of your past all the time and put it behind you and move on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's the teaching of Purim also, also, you know, the idea of this weird verse that we study, or like, remember to forget the name of, or to erase the name of Amalek. Yeah. I think this is precisely what we have a hard time doing, you know, we have to remember enough so that it can be erased partly from our memory. At least in my mental image, and this is based on nothing other than my mental image, Menasha also must have been humble. And humility is not a quality that seems to be very talked about or encouraged. Self-esteem a lot, but humility not so much. Is that true in France as well? Well, yeah, I think it's uh, it's very difficult to we, we don't we don't really know how to build an education today uh, upon you know both this. You know, this old Jewish legend of people walking with a, a piece of paper in each pocket, like the world was created for you and you are nothing but dust and, you know. <laughs> right. And I think that uh, today we tend, you know, in our society to raise children on, on the notion of the fact that the world was created for them because we don't really know 
uh, how to help them deal with the, the idea of, you know, the Abrahamic sentence, you are nothing but dust, you know. Right. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's actually the balance between the two papers is... Uh, is essential and we we don't really know how to, how to teach it uh, today it is it, it, it is a difficult thing especially when so much of our um, so much of our society is built on self-promotion um, social media is about self-promotion from the time you're very very young um, and I always wonder for example um, whether I, I mean, my daughter is too old to have done this, but I wonder whether I would have put her on social media when she was a little kid. I hope not. I hope not. But I see how many parents from the time the child is born, from the baby pictures on, your entire life is recorded for the public to applaud, which is a difficult way to grow up. Mm. So. Well, I, th I think um, American society is is very strong at building self confidence. Also, I, I'm for me it was interesting when I came to America to study in the university at the rabbinic yeah. seminary. I, I had received a French education, and the French education is, is quite inhibiting in the way that uh, when you when the teacher asks you, do you have a question, and you raise your hand, you'd better have a good question because ah. you're not super young. And I felt that in America, the opposite has, had been um, explained to my peers, you know, to my colleagues. Like I remember for me, it was a topic of right. uh, uh, surprise that at the end of each class, the professor would say, is there any question? And, and very easily in America, people are encouraged to share, which I think is good. Right. It's very empowering, as you would say in America. But, but at the same time, it creates a situation of, um, yeah, of very, of very strong confidence. It goes with good and bad elements. Sure, it doesn't matter if you have a good question or not. You have to ask a question. It's just yeah, uh, yeah. sometimes it's not even a question. It's like it's sometimes no. It's just I'd like to tell you what I think. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, but, uh, but since we've come to the end of our time, I do want to actually end with a question. But before I do, I once again want to thank, first of all, Abner and Roz Goldstein for, again, bringing a wonderful scholar to our community um, and uh, also to our scholar and residents for teaching us and enlightening us and uh, inspiring us over these past three days. Um, and what I suppose I want to I, I wanna end by asking you is, You've gotten to know three different communities of Jews very well, um, Israel, the United States, and France. And most of us don't get that. Most of us, if, at least in our country, if we're lucky, we might know Israel and the United States, but not Europe. Um, and, and I wonder what you see as, with all the various challenges facing the Jewish people, how you feel sort of globally in terms of pessimism, optimism, what do you see as uh, the things to watch for in the Jewish future, not in the next hundred years, but in the next, say, five to 10 years? Well, I'll say something very simple. I just what I learned from this experience is how much we need to learn from each other. You know how much we actually tend to believe, especially I would say America, France and Israel are three places which through their history, tend to believe they are kind of at the heart of the world, you know, and it's an historical heritage, you know, it's like each one of our country tends to believe it's the golden Medina in yeah. some way for the Jews, you know, French yeah. Jews have a very high idea of the Jewish emancipation and the type of history that happened yeah. here. American Jews definitely have this idea of a golden yeah. Medina. And Israel today very often perceives itself as being the place you know, the, the capital of the Jews, meaning like the idea, the, the place where Jewishness can be played in authenticity. And I think we all need to learn humbly how much uh, there is no such place as an authentic place for being more Jewish or a better Jew, but how much we really do need to learn from each other's um, experience because more or less, we are going to go through the same, the same challenges in the coming years, except those challenges won't be expressed in the same tonality, with the same language, in the same context. But we have to find a way to translate, in a way, our challenges, to explain them to each other. It's vital. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to learning more. Take care. Thank you.